Jason? I am not. I am in the office. <laughs> Welcome to Science Chat. Every week we bring you an amazing expert to enthrall you with their area of knowledge. This week we have Kathleen Morrow, who is one of the authors of a groundbreaking research that took a look at dog breeds and characteristics and traits and found, I'm not going to give it away, some rather, I guess, unusual, shocking findings that you wouldn't think about. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Kathleen Morrow to Science Chat tonight. How are you doing, Kathleen? Great. Good to be here. Ah, I'm so happy to hear talk to you again. We spoke like two and a half years ago on the podcast. I know. I was like deep in the weeds of my dissertation at that point, too. <laughs> now, are you still a PhD student or, you, or have you finished your doctorate? I am. I am still a PhD student. Okay. I'm aiming to finish up, uh, write, defend um, this coming spring. Oh, well, we'll be cheering, cheering for you when that happens. Let us know and we'll send you some good vibes or dog po- photos. Thank you. <laughs> um, and Kathleen, is it, do you go by Kathleen or is it Kathy? Do you shorten it or is it, do you go by Kathleen? I actually don't usually shorten it. I just go by Kathleen. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I just wanted to double check that and not uh, say your first name wrong for more than a oh, couple yeah, times. No worries. Okay, so uh, if you are just joining us for the first time on Science Chat, we have an interview with a guest. After that, we open up floor. We open up the floor to questions. So you'll have to just be patient uh, if you have questions for our guest. And again, <clears throat> if you've never been in our space before, I do. Uh, we do curate the people who are requesting the mic, meaning that we do check your profile. Um, and now that we're simulcasting on two different audio sites, three different audio sites, we're on Wisdom right now. And we're on Clubhouse. So those of you listening on Clubhouse and Wisdom, when it's time to ask to come up to the stage, to come up to the chat to ask questions, we welcome you with open arms. So uh, Kathleen, kind of the first, I guess, icebreaking question is where where are you in the world? I'm uh, in Massachusetts around like, uh, I think I would say it's kind of midway from, um, it's not quite Boston, but I'm out in Worcester. Okay. Anyone's familiar with that in the United States? Okay. Yep. Well, I'm familiar with Boston. About an hour from there, okay. uh, if you head west. Okay. So that's like how I guess where our where we live, Red Deer, is in relation to Edmonton or Calgary, which is the Canadian cities people maybe have heard of. Um, yeah. If I, if I had if I headed up straight north, I'd head to Quebec. I would say. Ooh, go to Quebec, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is bilingual. Oui, bien. <laughs> oui, Allons-y. Oui, la bibliothèque, Kristen. Oui. That's where is the library. Um, I can't speak. Anyways. Yeah. That's, um, that's only the only word Jason knows. <laughs> um, Kathleen, if I was to, like, if you were to call yourself a scientist, like you are a scientist, but what would you classify your area of science as? So I would say it's genetics, but genetics, it's kind okay. of a, a much bigger scale than traditional genetics. Uh, so we do a lot of genomics. So we look at across the entire genome and account for all the differences that exist in like billions and billions of bases of DNA. So big, and many, many individuals. Yeah. Big, big picture genetics. Yeah. Big data genetics. Big data genetics. Okay. And what, uh, what got you into science in the first place? You're on this journey an exciting one in the last like six months with your, with that, with that paper that came out. Um, but it's not for the faint of heart to pursue a PhD. What, uh, what was the bug that got you into science? I would say I really, I mean, I think that a love of animals kind of draws anyone naturally towards biology. Um, mm. So I started on the path of a biologist um, in undergrad, but then I really got into genetics. So I started studying plant genetics and then I, pivoted and studied fly genetics and genetics is something I've always been just fascinated with how DNA gives rise to all sorts of different organisms. Did and you, did I think you have I, to do with that intro lab with Dropsophila where you bred them for different eye colors. Did you have to do that? Close. We, okay. um, I don't know. <laughs> I did uh, actually bred worms for different pooping phenotypes. So uh, basically whether or not they would defecate at a certain rate. Oh, well, so, I know we can probably do that with Bunsen or Beaker and just depends on the food they get. They definitely yeah, defecate exactly. at different rates. 
Um, so it was it was definitely within the realm of like what we call model animals. Um, okay. So like tiny little sea elegans, the little tiny worms that you can grow on a plate. Okay. I had to do something with flies and it wasn't because I was in chemistry and it was my biology elective. I never took it seriously and I probably should have. I, and looking back, it was kind of cool that we bred the flies for, I think for, for different eye colors or something like that. Oh um, yeah. 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 The, the white eyed versus red eyed flies. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. But they kept waking up. Like you had to gas them with ether or something like that. And they kept waking up and flying away on me. So that was very frustrating because I would lose my flies and then the lab tech would they'd get mad away. at me. Yeah, yeah, they'd fly away. Um, so I guess that's why I was never cut out to be a biologist. Um, so from into genetics, you went into your undergrad. Um, and I know in the podcast we talked about you got to work with wolf puppies on some some things. Oh, yeah. That was actually kind of my first year in graduate school, okay. right after I joined um, my current lab. And we have kind of a wolf expert in our lab. Uh, she's been studying uh, wolf puppies, wolf development, and she had contacts with a zoo in Quebec that had a, two litters of wolf puppies at the same time. Two sister wolves had puppies at the same time. And that was part of a project where she was studying the early socialization and the early critical period of puppy development in, in both wolves and dogs, but she needed more wolf data. Okay. So each week, each week, like a group from our lab, um, a few people would go up to Quebec, work with the puppies um, and just like track their development. And I think I went on week eight since they were born. And so <laughs> uh, did you get to hold the wolf puppies? Cause that's, I know yeah. there's probably some like serious science, but that, that's what, that's what I would be like. To get to see oh yeah. Them. Yeah. They were super soft. They were super playful. I think, this was at the point where they could like see and hear and actually play around. Um, they weren't too unlike dog puppies in my opinion, except I'd say that they were a lot more excitable and like, they'd be much more into like gnawing on your arm and that <laughs> sort of thing. So but they were so cute. Now what uh, were you, were you there to help gather data? What was, what was the overall like mission um, in seeing the wolf puppies? I'm sorry if I missed that. Yeah, the mission was um, actually sort of similar to you had Emily Bray on that we were doing puppy tests where um, you'd show them kind of a novel object, something that was they've never seen before um, and a familiar object. And you'd basically see week by week whether or not they'd be uh, afraid of the new thing, uh, interested and curious about the new thing. And alongside that, we were also collecting saliva for their DNA and urine for their cortisol levels. Okay, and was there anything that you found from that, or is that that still ongoing? That one's still ongoing, so um, can't learn a whole lot from just a single litter of puppies, but <laughs> over time, we'll get more and more data from more and more litters. Aww. Hello, I'm Imogen, and I have a story to tell you. It concerns rabbits, a couple of cats, a fox, and something called a slow loris, which is a funny-looking primate with big eyes. The story in question has a kidnapping, a daring escape, and later I think there's a cow made of chocolate. Oh, and the story is called Molly Whiskers and the Blue Tentacle. And there's more info about the show at mollywhiskers.com. So that brings us to the big, the big story. Um, you had to, we were going to have you on this show a little earlier, but you had, you were being kind of like, um, in, in email back and forth, you were like, oh, there's this study coming out and it's kind of, you know, we, we can't talk till it's published. And I'm like, okay. And then when it came out, it became this massive, huge deal that was in, like, it was published by nature. It was picked up by like literally every single science um, science show, science website, plus all of the major media outlets. It was on CBC up in Canada. I was like, it was on C C C Edmonton CBC. Um, so yeah, it was, it was wild. It was, I mean, congratulations for one. That's so cool. 
Um, but let, for people that maybe don't know what we're talking about, can we break down this study? What was yeah, it about? Yeah. Let's, let's, let's start with what was it about? Yeah, so the study, um, it was uh, published in Science. And at the time, I had scheduled to come on SciChat a while back. Um, but it hit just in the period of time where they have what you call embargo, where you're not supposed to talk about what you're working on. <laughs> um, so I felt super bad, had to cancel. But basically, it's the culmination of um, a large portion of our project we call Darwin's Ark. It's a community science project that aims to study the relationship between genetics and behavior and genetics and health in companion dogs. And what we sought out to answer was just what is the relationship between dog breeds and dog behavior? How extensive is it? Um, does it matter when we're trying to understand um, the genetic relationship between um, how dogs act and what their DNA looks like mm -hmm. and kind of like are the assumptions we have about breeds and kind of how the kennel clubs describe breeds personalities how true is that and we tried to tackle it from like so many different angles okay so let's talk about the first one is dog breeds if you read like we have this book what is Chris what do you call it the super stat book is that what you call it? We call it like some kind of like the super stat book. Yeah, the super stats. Yeah, the super stats. So it's got all of the different recognized dog breeds. And then it's got like their power stats, like uh, friendliness, grooming, um, uh, you know, ease to easy to train. And it all it has their stats out of five. And then it's like got a doggy like, stat block. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's almost like we're looking at Marvel superheroes and it's ranking them like, oh, the Hulk's really st strong. But when he's the Hulk, he's kind of not so smart. Um, so that kind of thing, right? Uh, or like Tony Stark's really smart, um, but he's kind of a jerk. So he doesn't play well with others. One out of five kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. But then it also describes like the quote unquote personality of the dog breed. So like Bernice Mountain Dogs in this book, I read it before we chatted today. It was like a stoic breed that can be aloof, um, but is a great family dog and a calming presence. So like, that's what they wrote about the, the dog breed. Now, this is what you were trying to tackle. Is that, am I, are we, am I on the right track? Like does yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. 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 These are what we would call stereotypes. They're kind of, um, you know, descriptions that people assign to the entire population of dogs that would be called a Bernie's mountain dog. And it's kind of funny because the idea that they're aloof is almost exactly the opposite from what owners told us about their Bernese mountain dog. <laughs> well, yeah. Like Bunsen is pretty gregarious. Like, um, especially with, he loves people. <laughs> He's not. A yeah. We, we almost saw that on average, um, a random Bernese mountain dog tended to be more affectionate and less aloof than an average random dog, wow. which was, so would the, be kind of exactly opposite that stereotype of, of being standoffish. Yes. Yeah, that is exactly the opposite. Now, the question, the, the question and maybe what people are really interested in is how did you get all this data? How, how did how, how did the gate data get gathered? And then maybe after that, we'll talk about the, the wild conclusion of this huge study. Yeah. So the way the data was collected is we constructed this portal, this uh, community science um, platform where people could sign up their companion dog. They could tell us a bit about the dog's background, um, their demographics, and then they could fill out a series of questionnaires about their behavior. And these all address different topics from, you know, separation anxiety type of phenotypes to um, things like how your dog plays with others, uh, their feeding behavior and that sort of thing. And we, we, didn't want to limit our study enrollment to just dogs of any particular breed or even just to purebred dogs. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of dog research has been focused primarily on dog breeds. So we wanted to study as many dogs as possible for us. It was more of a numbers game. Um, if we open up the gates to more dogs, we'll get more data. And this includes uh, means including dogs of mixed ancestry, um, which has been rather unusual in the dog genetics world. And, Mixed breed dogs have actually rarely had their genomes fully sequenced. So we did that for the first time with 27 dogs who's had their DNA scanned from end to almost from end to end um, uh, deeper than ever before. Hmm. 
Now, am I, hopefully I don't, I'm not getting this wrong. Was this the Darwin's arc we talked about a couple of years ago that this was the start of that? The Darwin's yeah, dogs. Exactly. Sorry, Darwin's, Darwin's uh, dogs. So uh, we called the platform Darwin's Ark, but the project was Darwin's Dogs. Right. Because we hope to expand it out one day to more than just uh, dogs, but also to companion cats. Oh, cats. That's cool. Eventually. <laughs> still, in the, still in the process. I uh, don't know. I think you'll probably get back that most cats are kind of cats. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I know some people say their cats are just like dogs. That's true. We have a cat. We love We love Ginger. Um, I met some extremely dog-like cats in my life. This is day. true. Yeah, they they fetch and everything. Um, so we, I, I, I believe I tweeted out that link, and there might be some people in the chat right now that actually put their dog through that questionnaire when it when it uh, came out. Um, is anybody in the chat right now have their dog in that? Uh, that did you put your dog through that questionnaire? Put a heart if that if that was one of you. I know there's some people that. Um, put their yeah so Kathy I know did mm-hmm. yeah look yeah there's some people that actually put their dog in that we put both Bunsen and Beaker through that um, and it was a, a big questionnaire like I'm not gonna lie it took a while like it was how many questions a hundred questions or something like that like it was pretty intense yeah the initial release was around 110 questions um, since then we've added several surveys so it's it's gotten more close to 200 or so Oof. and how many dogs because data is always good in science, right? That's the thing is you, you don't want a sample size of five. Um, no, absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> how many dogs are we talking about that were in the study? So in this uh, particular study that was published, we were close to t- a little over 20,000, I think it was. And wow. now we have over 35,000 dogs enrolled. Wow. That's incredible. When I do uh, pet science stuff on the podcast, like – When they're looking at dogs, it's like, I don't know, a couple hundred seems like a big dog study. Um, Yeah, I mean, that is really, a couple hundred is really impressive when you're doing uh, in-person assessments of behavior. mm -hmm. I think part of the scale that we got here was because it was owner assessments, um, which come with their own caveats, of course. Um, Right. Yeah. Because like you, you, you always paint your dog as the protagonist of the story. Yeah. And that's almost why it was kind of challenging in the past to study the relationship between breed and behavior because personality stereotypes about dog breeds have been around for quite a while and they're very pervasive and it's kind of difficult to discern whether a dog acts a certain way because they are a certain breed or whether their person believes their dog's personality fulfills their breed's description and that's kind of why looking at the mixed breed dogs offered us some advantage um, because the the owner's breed biases could play a little bit less of a role in their assessment. Oh, that's fascinating because if you don't know, if you have no idea what, what breed of dog you're is, because it's a mix of a bunch, you have little biases going into any kind of surveys about their personality. Right. And then if the, if the idea is that the breed differences are genetic, there should be some sway for dogs that have a greater uh, proportion of ancestry from one given breed. Hmm. And some of these, uh, some of these dogs um, in the study, they, they, people sent DNA in of their dogs, like a saliva thing. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Now that's a smaller subset, of course, too. That was around 2000 dogs that we um, built up a collection of genetic data from, but over half of them were, you know, of mixed breed ancestry. Wow. Hi, this is Ross, the host of Smells Like Humans, a show about interesting and quirky human behavior. We bring humor, empathy, and warmth to topics such as relationships, dating, work, self-compassion, weddings, phobias, aging parents, travel mishaps, death, and many more. Ever wonder what happens at a cuddle party? We talk about it. Free-range kids in restaurants? We've got some thoughts. Bedtime stories for adults? We're on it. Light, fun, unscripted conversation and personal stories. Please join us by clicking the link in the show notes. Okay, so there was lots of dogs. Um, there was dog breeds. There was purebred dogs. There's mixed mixed dog breeds. Was there? Yeah. I've. Uh, it's a silly question, but was there a dog breed that stood out as having the most people respond about it? 
Um, did it oh, kind yeah. of did it kind of track with like the most popular dog breed in the United States, like the Labrador Retriever? Yeah, it absolutely tracked with the common like the popularity of the dog breed was strongly related to how common that dog was in Darwin's Ark, and also how common its ancestry was in mixed breed dogs. With some exceptions, um, I think it's been observed before that there's a lot of chow chow ancestry in mixed breed dogs in the United States, whereas today they're not a super popular breed. And that may be because they were very popular. If you count some years back, they were popular and they made their way into the dog population genetically. And so the mutts might be kind of a snapshot of breeds that used to be popular and no longer are so. Okay. Interesting. I didn't know that. What? How? How long ago were Chow Chows popular? I heard they were an '80s fad really? in some sense, but I I don't know if there's a lot of data to back up like why or whether they were that popular. That is wild. You know what? I'm trying to think. I like a Chow Chow is just about as rare as a Great Dane in where we live. Like they're just not a super common dog. Yeah, I I tend to think of the Dalmatian as a dog that used to be very popular, mm. but is a less popular breed now. This that's true At too. Yeah, I like, don't I don't see it as often anymore. Yeah, that's true too. Okay, I got a sidetrack talking about dog breeds because I was just curious. Uh, <laughs> so lots of dogs, lots of dog breeds, mixed dog breeds. You have some of their DNA. What was the conclusion of the study with all of this data that you had? Our conclusion was that as far as personality goes, breed was not particularly a good predictor of an individual's behavior, even though there were some population level differences we saw for some breeds. So it was the relationship between behavior and breed was not as extensive as we would have thought, given all the stereotypes surrounding uh, breeds and behavior. But um, we did find some breeds had distinct behaviors relative to other uh, dogs. Um, it was kind of interesting because we think of dog breeds as kind of like big families, and we tend to think of genetics and breed as synonymous. Mm. And it's true that dogs like within a breed are genetically related to each other, but they're also not clones of one another, which shouldn't be surprising. So breed isn't a perfect proxy for genetics in any way. We do see that genetics does matter for certain behaviors, and we do see that behaviors related to kind of working traits, like herding, um, retrieving, those tend to be the behaviors that are more inherited uh, kind of at a breed level. So a dog like a border collie, which traditionally is a working class dog that herds yeah. in the border collie breed, that's something that that trait is more common um yeah exactly so that tracks yeah. with the breed characteristics that we would think of um yeah. and i guess like goldens and labradors are, do they retrieve better did your study find that too they retrieve more often than other other dogs for sure so those kind of behaviors we do see differences um in breeds but it's not no behavior was completely unique to any given breed either wow yeah like occasionally bunsen will get something but most of the time if i huck a toy he just looks at me like, why did you do that? That's so, what are far, you expecting? Away. Yeah. That's so far away <laughs> and I'm laying down. It's that's a lot of work to go get that. And why did you throw that so far away? Um, I think he look, just looks annoyed. Whereas Beaker, she's like, woohoo, this, I don't know. I'll get it. <laughs> um, anyways. But yeah, th this result is something that didn't really surprise us as behavioral geneticists because we know that the way a dog acts, um, and their personality is something that's really kind of complicated. It's not explained completely by genetics. It's something that's influenced a lot by their early experiences, how they grew up, um, their environment and that sort of thing. So it wasn't something that surprised us incredibly, but it was surprising just based on how, how much stake society puts on dog breeds acting a certain way. Now in the various media publications, like I was kind of trolling through uh, the interwebs, and I was looking at how CNN, for example, talked about your study, or um, Fox News, like some of the American outlets and CBC, and they all of them were throwing around a percentage of how, like the percentage of breed characteristics that actually f tracked with your study. 
were, were those numbers they were using somewhat accurate? Like, do you have a percentage or do you think they were just doing some like rough calculations after their science person skimmed the study? I think they needed a percentage. So we, we gave them the average, but okay. it's definitely on a spectrum. It's definitely on a spectrum okay. for to what degree breed influences behavior. Cause I felt um, it was, talk- Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah. We talk a lot throughout the paper about kind of these eight uh, behavioral factors that we discovered by analyzing the survey data. And those kind of describe what I would call kind of dog personality traits, uh, their sociability, how um, easy they are to train or how much they will, you know, ignore your requests um, and how (laughs) proximity seeking they are, like whether they're affection or whether they're more hands off. And those kind of behavioral traits, those personality type traits, don't seem as influenced by breed as discrete behaviors like retrieves a ball or uh, chases small animals or um, or what have you. So yeah, that was more that was more of an average on something that exists on a spectrum. Okay, because I, I, what I was going to say is I felt their number was like the number all of these different media outlets were saying was like super low, like less than twenty percent even. It was 9%. Yeah. 9%. Okay. I was going to say 11. Um, I'm trying to look through my notes. Okay. 9%. Wow. So in the end, from all of this data, one thing that we can think about is that dogs are more individualistic than they are characteristic of their breeds. Like, is that a safe assumption? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of variation within the breeds too, which also I don't think super surprising, but it's uh definitely something to consider when you look at a dog not to judge them by their cover either it's they are very individual and we shouldn't treat them as clones of one another no that's you know i was um i talked to a dog trainer uh i was on her podcast actually and i brought up your study and she said dog trainers know that they know that you can have five whatever golden retrievers And all five of them are going to be completely different when it's time to train them. So it's like maybe people that work with dogs day in, day out know this rather than the general public too. Yeah. And I think that one of the um, things that kind of got misunderstood a bit um, in the media and in kind of the discussions around the study was that behavior can still be something that has genetic influences, can be kind of inherited without it actually being different between dog breeds. So sometimes the lineage of a dog's family has a bigger role in his or her disposition than which breed they are. So if you know, like your dog's parents were pretty chill dogs, the puppies might be chill dogs and it could just be, you know, the line of the dogs that was bred to be more chill or in working populations, if you're specifically breeding dogs for performance and not just for how they look, you would expect them to be more behaviorally distinct. So populations like guide dogs um, have been rigorously tested Mm -hmm. for their behavior when selecting what parents they're going to use to breed the next generation of guide dogs. Yeah, and I see. So for something like that, yeah, you'd see that the working Labradors who are guide dogs are going to be pretty distinct from dogs that are just bred to, you know, look good for the show. Hmm. I feel, I don't want to put, uh, I like I see Dr. Emily Bray in the space and I feel that something maybe we talked about that um, like there is, there's a sweet spot for those guide dogs of what the parents need to have they interact with their puppies. Like they can't be too motherly. They kind of have to let the puppies kind of like sink or swim a bit. And then they're a better guide dog too. So there's all of these. And that would be a genetic thing that that dog would do. Like it would just do that. Um, it wouldn't be taught. Yeah. It's also it's hard to breed for behavior too. That's some, it's easy to breed for something where you can visually see it too. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's harder to say, okay, so I'm going to consider these dogs personality. You have to think about them over their whole life. That is fascinating because we were, we were told um, that Beaker uh, our golden. She comes from a hunting line of goldens. Like they're, the 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 family that has the the goldens they they use them as you know a hunting dog because that's what goldens were bred for it's in one instance yeah and uh, her prey drive is like off the charts like <laughs> small animals birds watch out like she'll triangulate birds out of the air and she's caught a couple while they've been flying like that's neo from, like neo from the matrix like it's just um 
Um, luckily, it hasn't been like in town where people can shame us. It's been like on our farm. But anyway, whereas Bunsen is more of like a moose scavenger. Oh yeah, he's a scavenger. He when birds fly around, they could land on his head, and he'd be like do 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 whatever. You know, like he's he doesn't care about other animals. He's, he's he wants to be their friend, and that's probably what led to the porcupine incident because um, he got too close to it and sniffed it or something, got a face full of quills. But yeah, <laughs> that is so. Yeah, it is. I love that though. That um, whatever we think of a breed, their their ancestry of the the ancestry of their characteristics, like how they are actually are, might be more important than their breed. Yeah, and also all the breeds, well, many of the breeds came from an older population before the breeds were really established as, you know, what we call modern breeds, where they're bred, you know, for the consistency in their lineage and to each other. There were dogs fulfilling different jobs all across the world. You didn't necessarily call them a certain name, but they were doing jobs like Bunsen's ancestors way back could be guarding livestock and uh, Beaker's ancestors would be you know, helping in hunts. And even recently her ancestors were still performing those working roles. Mm. And that's maybe more important than, um, you know, fulfilling a certain look or shape that uh, many breed definitions focus on. Mm. I have two more questions before we open it up uh, to our audience to ask you some things. Um, First off, were you shocked how far and wide the study went? Like, um, I was like, uh, if people don't know it, it was all over the place. And I was looking through all of these different like science articles and on all these different major media outlets. I was like Kathleen Morrow. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Was it a bit overwhelming or were you just so happy that it resonated with people? It was pretty overwhelming to be honest. (laughs) Like, um, I knew it was coming to some degree because, um, when we were putting together the paper and, we were tackling this from so many different angles. We had in our mind, not just the, what questions do we answer for the genomics world who are interested in dogs um, and the disorders that they experience, but also how, how do we present this in a way that's accessible to the dog world? People who love dogs, who have dogs, who breed dogs, who live with dogs. And what questions will they have that we can answer here that, not necessarily the reviewers or others in our field would be interested in, but stuff like how reliable are people's predictions about a dog's ancestry based on appearance? Um, are there any examples that um, of dog breeds exhibiting behaviors that wouldn't be considered characteristic for their breed? Is there anything we can talk about in the paper that will be more interesting for the general public to hear about than pigeonholing ourselves into, you know, what can address the scientific questions in our field? but also just the curiosity questions. So we knew that it would be, there would be some buzz about it. And we wanted to talk about this question from enough angles that it's of interest, not just to other scientists, but also to other dog people. Hey, Jordan Harbinger here of The Jordan Harbinger Show. Subscribe to the only show that will show you how to apply the world's greatest ideas from the most striking minds. We've got spies and CEOs, athletes and authors from Kobe Bryant to Malcolm Gladwell, Tony Hawk and Howie Mandel, and the chairman of Google, founders of LinkedIn and Instagram, antiquity smugglers, con men, brilliant scientists, national heroes, and even the head of the CIA. Come join and have a listen for yourself. Subscribe right now to The Jordan Harbinger Show, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you're listening now. And then my other question was, <laughs> did you get, did people as part of the study, did you feel any pushback from people that really think a certain breed has a certain characteristic? Um, or like, I don't know, I, I would imagine just because we run the Bunsen and Beaker account on Twitter, anytime I tweet anything about science, we're, we're always getting somebody somewhere that's like the earth is flat and birds don't exist kind of thing. Right. So I was just curious if you got any pushback about that. Yeah. There's a lot of passion about dogs. Yeah. That passion. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> there's passion. I'm surprised. I only received one uh, piece of hate mail um, about <laughs> pit bull terriers, but um, there was, you know, pushback from people who really believe that uh, breed is like some sort of horoscope. 
Well, we as scientists, we all know what's up with horoscopes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I actually talked about that. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to be selected to talk to. Um, I was one of the teachers that gave a speech at uh, grad for the grad students, and I talked about um, at the start the the horoscope and how because the Earth wobbles whatever zodiac sign you think you are is off by like thousands of years. Um, and I actually taught that in a class one time because we were talking about space and a girl ran out of my class crying and I was like, Oh my goodness, what happened? And she had just got a tattoo of her zodiac sign that, Oh no. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's astronomically inaccurate. Yeah. I felt really bad because she's like put her whole heart and soul into that. She was a Scorpio or whatever it was. And, um, and then here comes Mr. Jerk teacher just busting her hopes and dreams. Um, but I guess, you know, when you think of it, if you, if you are a dog breeder, this study is potentially, aside from the look of your dog, this study is potentially pops the balloon of all of the different characteristics of the breed. You might have to like rethink how you market your animal and that the line of the animals has these characteristics then. Yeah, I'd say yes and no. Um, our study does show that genetics can be important for certain behaviors too, but it it more points up towards the fact that if you're just breeding solely for visual appearance and not mm. keeping in mind other things like general health and personality, then your line could sway towards not being very distinct. But it also points to the idea that you you could breed a healthier, um, more uh, personality stable dog if those are the things you prioritize. So, oh. yeah, I could see where it could ruffle some feathers, but it doesn't entirely disprove all the ideas we have about dogs and how different dogs have been bred for different working traits and that sort of thing. You know, I've read that before and I love Bunsen, right? We love Bunsen and Beaker and they are Bernice Mountain Dog and Golden Retriever. Um, But I read that if a breeder wanted to and they didn't care what the dog looked like over 50 to 60 years, you could breed like a dog that potentially could live a little longer and be the super friendly dog. Um, if you didn't care about the physical characteristics, is that where you're getting with that, with that? It's, it's not, uh, I don't know. It's not quite a one way or the other type of thing. Okay. But okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that it's all about, you know, prioritizing the dog. And I wouldn't say that I'd give any guidance to breeders on how to better breed your dog either. Right. Yeah. But I could see where, you know, the idea that breed might not be as important to personality could feel threatening in some way. Mm-hmm. Well, I just find it fascinating. Um, if you're just joining us right now for science chat, uh, we have Kathleen Morrow, who's one of the authors of this groundbreaking study on dog breeds and characteristics. And we got a number. It was 9%, 9% of the dog breed characteristics matched up with the dog breed itself. And then of course that's a spectrum. And it's just, that was a, the, the number you had to give the media outlets. So um, <clears throat> probably somebody's going to ask it. So I'll leave this question for, for one of our audience members. But if you have a question for Kathleen, now, are you comfortable answering questions about the study? Like if somebody says, Hey, I've got this type of dog. What did your study find? Are you, are you comfortable with that type of question? Yeah, totally. Okay. So if you have a question for Kathleen about her, about the study about dog breeds and characteristics, we are inviting you to come up to the stage now and ask. Um, so we've got some people up there. Uh, Chris, is your phone working? Yes. It must uh, not be. great. Not great. It's not working great, but I got Kathy and Sarah. Okay. We got some more people. Chris needs a new phone because sometimes in spaces her phone is like not so great. So. <laughs> okay, I'll add, I'll, I'll move those people up. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um, first of all, I'm so glad you're doing this study. And I enrolled my Bernese Mountain Dog and Golden Retriever based on having heard you a couple of years ago on the podcast. Um, and I was relieved to see the results because as I was filling out the questionnaire, it was like, wow, I must have an odd Bernese Mountain Dog because she doesn't (laughs) fit anything that the AKC says about Bernese Mountain Dogs. Um, And since then, in interacting with people, 
um, on Twitter and other places who have Bernie's Mountain Dogs, it's like, yeah, they're Velcro dogs. They stick to the human being as opposed to being aloof. So, so your study was really in, informative um, in that way. And we also did do the DNA on both of ours. And I was relieved to see that, yes, they are purebred, just like the breeder said. But. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> sort of knew that actually with these two breeders. Um, so my question for you is, um, what have the reactions been from people as they see that study and they see that relatively small percentage compared to what they thought is within a breed? I think it's been one of the two reactions. It's either the, oh, yeah, I've always known that. Why did they even have to study it? <laughs> Or it's the, well, 9% is actually a huge percentage. That matters a lot. Mm. And in the genetics world, yeah, I mean, that matters a lot. That's why we study dogs because they're so they're so different in their different behaviors and personalities because they are so distinct. So th that, that 9% for us geneticists is like, wow, cool. We could find a lot of interesting genes here that might underlie oh. why retrievers retrieve or why certain dogs develop anxiety, why they develop compulsive behaviors. For us, that's like a huge number. But at the same time, it's a lot less than what people commonly think about when they think about dog breed personalities. And I know you can't really do this like within a short period of time, but it would be interesting to see how that changes over time. Um, we have a golden retriever who has no interest whatsoever in retrieving, swimming, or going after prey except for a squirrel. Um, but she's an English cream golden retriever and other people I've talked to have that same sort say, yeah, my dog doesn't care about any of that stuff. <laughs> but, but then there's Beaker at, at the extreme. So my second question and my final one is, um, will you be doing, do you foresee that the group that you work with are going to be doing studies within say retrievers, within goldens or labs, um, to see some of those differences? I think we'll need a whole lot more dogs sequenced within a single breed to be able to study within the breed, but I could see us doing something like that. So actually we had, um, we had a rotation student in our lab, which is basically a grad student that comes and um, joins the lab for a period of time to do a project who's really involved with uh, Brittany's uh, dogs. That you, I think they were called Brittany Spaniels, but they actually yeah. dropped this they dropped the spaniel part because there's actually huge diversity in the kinds of working behaviors that Brittany's perform. So some of them do the eye stalk, some of them do the pointing, some of them are really good retrievers. So there's like this variation, those kind of working behaviors. And so we've been talking about maybe there's a way we could get a lot of the people who have Brittany's to tell us about those behaviors their dogs perform and see within the breed whether there's genetic differences we can ascribe to a dog that's more about the pointing and dog that's more about the retrieving. Oh, that's great. And are you still, people can still enroll their dogs. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. It's an ongoing study. Um, it'll continue so long as we can get the grant money to support it. Okay. Well, I'll encourage people to enter their dogs then. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you love dogs, doing that survey was so fun. Like I, it was long, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, it was yeah. really fun. We tried to minimize survey fatigue as much as we could by, you know, making the surveys kind of bite-sized and um, not too excessive with the write your dog on scale from zero to one for this behavior, that behavior, next behavior. You know, what you could do is like every 10 questions, a random dog photo comes up with a thumbs up or something like, keep going. You're doing good. Yeah. So they need courage. <laughs> okay. Over to Sarah. Hi. Hi, Sarah. I love, hi. I, I love this. Um, it, it immediately piqued my interest. I have a couple of questions um, for you, Kathleen, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, actually it brought up another one how was the study done was it simply done by people checking a box on their particular breed each year an average of 10 tropical storms develops over the atlantic ocean the caribbean sea and the gulf of mexico 
Six of those become hurricanes, and roughly five strike the United States coastline. Every week during hurricane season, we talk with tropical weather scientists, forecasters, hurricane hunters, and broadcasters, and hurricane chasers. Hear their thoughts and stories about their research, forecasts, and experiences with hurricanes on the Hurricane Center podcast. So for the breed information, we have them kind of input from um, their dog's profile, what breed they were. So we had the larger set of dogs that only had the survey information and the smaller set of dogs that had uh, surveys and genetic information. So wherever possible, um, we were confirming whether the dog was registered that breed or not registered that breed. So we performed all the statistics in both the larger set of dogs that didn't necessarily have registration, but their owner reported them a Labrador versus the smaller set of dogs that were confirmed to be Labrador retrievers. And then the even uh, the other subset of dogs that had it genetically confirmed as Labrador retrievers. So we tried to confirm across the different sets ones where we were less confident necessarily that the owners were telling us uh, the real breed versus the ones where we were more confident that what the owner reported was the breed in question. So what breeds were used in the study? So there were about, I would say 128 breeds had enough dogs to perform like all the, all of the different um, statistical analyses. Sometimes there, that number was more if the statistical, statistical testing question didn't require, say, 50 dogs per breed. Um, so but, you know. I just, okay. I, <laughs> I, I'm going to be the, the, I have to be the voice of opposition for just a second. Of course. So um, in my career, we've done a lot of studies. Our studies we found were less likely to be accurate when we are simply asking people a question, especially when it's for someone they love. For example, we, my company did a study um, about people with ADHD and we asked all these personal questions and it's very difficult to get an accurate study done when you are dealing with people that love their dogs. For example, um, when 101 Dalmatians came out, and I'm not talking the Cruella, I'm talking way back when I'm aging myself, but in the 90s, 80s, whatever, mm -hmm. the American Kennel Club came out and said, do not purchase Dalmatians for your children because they are not good family dogs. And here's why. There are studies that show that Dalmatians can be aggressive. They, um, you know, can tend to be territorial. And so they did this alert, alerting people that maybe it's not a good idea to, because they became one of the most popular dogs. So your while your study I think is fantastic it's sort of going against what we've always been told which is pit bulls um we don't want them you shouldn't have them because they are typically bred to be vicious um we had a vishla growing up um he was very sweet to us but our neighbor had to hide from him um because that is also an aggressive dog so when you're asking people, is your dog aggressive? Does your dog fetch? Does your dog do what a typical Labrador or Beagle should do? People, you're, people are viewing their dogs through their own rose-colored glasses, in my opinion. I, I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah, so there's the strong possibility for owner bias to have an effect on the directionality of uh, certain survey questions. I think that's also partly why we tried to avoid um, using the word aggression as well. I think there's always a value judgment when you see a survey question. You yourself think, step back and think, okay, do I want to answer this honestly? Because some questions can seem like they're actually getting at your values or judging in a sense, even if there's no one looking at you and saying and judging you for your answer. So there is that um, aspect that all surveys inherently will have owner bias. I think the way we try to overcome that is with scale. 
So for breeds where we have a large sample, um, we are trying to assess whether there's any directionality in the way owners answer about those dogs. And we admit that with purebred dogs, we think that there probably is some sort of owner bias playing um, in the answers that we see. I would um, agree. People tend yeah. to feel like I paid $2,000 for my dog and therefore there could be nothing wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a beagle owner um, and beagles are typically very loyal and, you know, they're sweet and they're smart. Um, but both of my dogs are as dumb as a bag of hammers, but we love them. <laughs> I mean, they're not, they're not typical, what I would say, beagles. Um, uh, Kathleen, yet, off the top of your head, what did, do you, do you remember anything from your study about beagles? Oh yes. I'd love, I'd love to hear it. They are um, significantly less interested in doing what you want them to do yes. or at least on average they never they owner, are owners, report that they, <laughs> owners report that they're more um what we call independent so we have this factor we discovered from the survey data called biddability and we call it that not because we think it's about whether the dog is smart or whether or not the dog is more trainable but it seems more to be a motivation thing um dogs who are more biddable are more inherently motivated to do things that you ask them to do. Whereas the dogs that fall on the more independent side of things, they're not necessarily less smart. So a lot of the livestock guarding dogs mm. appear to be uh, more independent. Um, but it could be that they're less motivated by, you know, just pleasing you, but more motivated by maybe external motivators like food or yeah, she'll do anything for any kind of food, um, but she, <laughs> but she won't. You know, she doesn't mind, um, and and is kind of a nightmare. But we love her, and if I were to take a survey today about what is the best dog to have for anything, I would check Beagle, <laughs> um, even though she's a nightmare, and <laughs> and we spend more time cleaning up after her than we did our own children. I've heard about this from a lot of beagle owners too. <laughs> but um, I think that I I am in agreement that it's the old nature versus nurture. Um, I think that um, how you raise your furry family member has a lot to do with how they are, you know, in their personality. What do you think about that? I think that's a actually very important. Um, I'd say that early socialization, the early life experience probably plays a lot of uh, a larger role probably than genetics for a lot of behavior. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect that we try to get at with our study is looking at the mixed breed dogs and trying to see whether there's any relationship between ancestry from a breed, but not necessarily at a perceivable level and their behavior and stuff like the independence of beagles or the ability of border collies is um, something that actually holds out in dogs that have a good amount of ancestry from those breeds. So that's how we try to cross-check ourselves and try to draw away from the breed perception biases. But I agree that also owner bias can be really difficult to account for when you're talking about survey data and not having um, an independent live assessment of a dog. Kath Kathleen, how much more time can you give us? There's a whole bunch more questions, but I, I do want to respect your time. Um, oh yeah, I have I, plenty of time. Okay, so if you're yeah. okay with that, I'll bring up the folks that have questions, and everybody's just going to have to be patient. Um, we'll, we'll we'll try to honor you and get to you all. Um, you can you can drop me back down to listener if you okay. want to. Sarah, that was a Thanks, that, that was an excellent question, by the way. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, Chris, do you know who's next? I I don't know. Um, either Paula, Liz, or Blue. Chris's phone is bricked, maybe. Okay, I'm going to randomly... Uh, no, uh, oh, okay, you're here. Hi. No, Jason, I'm not bricked. It, <laughs> it, was, it was... Hi. It was Kathy, Sarah, Paula, and then you you brought in a bunch of people, so I don't know the order after that. Kathy, Sarah, Paula. Okay, we'll go Paula, Liz, Blue, and then I'll bring up the people that are requesting, and we'll get to them. Sure. Okay. Okay. Hi, you guys. Hi, hi, Kathy. Nice to meet you, and fascinating study. Um, I'll try to be kind of quick here, but... Um, talking about chow chows, um, I, I guess I remember I always wanted a chow chow because I thought they were the coolest dogs. But I 
you know, I always heard they're very standoffish, kind of a family dog. But then I was just reading somewhere, too, where they're saying maybe it was like one of those, you know, books on breeds. But they said now they're trying to breed the chow chow to be a more friendly dog. So is that is that sort of like really coming into question with the breeders? Like they are going to try to is there any way that they can do something genetically to make the dog's characteristics be better behaved, if that's so, <laughs> if that's a term. But that was my first question. And I'll be really quick. I, I have a pooly who's a Hungarian sheepdog, and I'd love to take your survey because I don't know, have you ever done a pooly? They are super underrepresented. I'll say that like uh, poolies, I think are one of those breeds where if I see it, I just like flip out because I, they rarely, I rarely see them around. Oh. Well, we, we've had four in our, in our family growing up, you know, not at once, but I mean, four and we had twins, you know, we had brother and sister, but anyway, but uh, they've always seemed to be very, you know, guard like dogs too. And they, they protect the family, but they can be friendly to some, but not friendly to others. So, and that trait I've seen in other poolies that we've had. So it was kind of crazy. And I also have Brussels Griffons. So if you could give me a take on that real quick and, and if you have a link to your survey, I don't know if Jason, you could put it up. I would love to take uh, that. I can tweet about it. Yeah, I can tweet about yeah. it. Um, okay. I'll, I'll get on that right now while Kathleen's talking. All right. Thank you so much. And I and thank you again for answering all my questions. I truly appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, with the breeding for personality question. So um, as I mentioned before, it's, of course, much easier to breed for a certain look of dog than it is to breed for personality of dog. Just inherently because you know you see the puppies you already know okay this one has the right marks this is the one I like this is the one I'm going to keep in my lines versus the personality is something that you know it takes a while for it to settle in any kind of dog um, so with the guide dog breeding programs they have that access to the adult dogs that they've put out they can call them back for breeding and that sort of thing so it takes a lot more mindfulness to breed for help health or temperament So with health, if you want to breed for a longer lived dog, you probably have to actually wait and see whether the dogs that you've bred live to a certain point and then call them back for breeding. So that makes it a much uh, more difficult challenge um, to breed for something as complex as behavior or or, um, longevity or health. At the same time, it's pretty powerful if you um, do keep to a strict... uh, regimen for breeding a dog i would say that that's how we came a how the working dogs came about was being very strict to which kind of dogs get bred the ones that will do the job and that sort of thing but yeah i would say it'd be a challenge but if people are trying to breed a more friendly uh chow chow then they probably have a plan behind it well, that's fascinating. And and I didn't know if you do you do ever do Brussels Griffons? I don't know if they're a popular breed or not, but they uh, they're kind of a Velcro dog. But I find them. I have two of them from two different litters, and one's a little bit more outgoing than the other. But they they are Velcro dogs. And I was warned that from the breeder that they'll follow you into the bathroom. So, you know, but you know, I didn't know if you had any, you know. Anything. Yeah, we definitely have a, a few in our study, but it was they there weren't enough of them to actually include them in statistical analysis. Okay, all right, well, great. Well, thank you very much, and and it's fascinating. I you know, and I'm from Connecticut, so yay, yay, I know where we're <laughs> like a Basenji. Just never see those okay. dogs. Okay, um, over to Liz, and then Blue, and then we'll, as I said, we'll try to we, we will get to all the speakers. Um, You'll just have to, we do things kind of in order. So we'll, you'll just have to be patient. Uh, go ahead, Liz. Awesome. Thank you. So I have like 10 million things running through my head. So I'm going to try <laughs> to get them out and not take up too much time. So um, congrats on the study. Getting published is everybody's dream who's in that kind of field. Um, so I know I'm kind of guilty of this. I have a tendency, and I'm sure many other people on this call do, to let's say anthropomorphize our dogs, you know, assigning human traits to them. (laughs) And I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing because, okay, so I'm like the people side of what you do. Like I'm the psychologist. So I'm thinking, you know, talk about trait theory with, you know, like the big five from a Korean Costa. 
why wouldn't we think that dogs and whatnot would have personality characteristics? And then if you take the people, certain people want to adopt certain types of dogs. Like I would never get a dog that has lots of energy. And then if we have dogs that are similar in personality to us, we normalize that. And I don't, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I just, <laughs> yeah, it's like, they're, it's like their baseline shifts for what they would rate as uh, like they, they have a personal rating baseline and a dog that exceeds that or is below that they might rate an uh, individual might rate as more extremely energetic or more extremely mm-hmm. lethargic in some sense yeah mm-hmm. and and when you go with your darwin stuff you know i always tell my students our goal in life is to pass on our genes and to live and everything we do is towards that end we change our behaviors to survive better so you might have like a super crazy dog who's going to chill out a lot like i had a catahoula all my dogs were in your study by the way um and she was very typically not a catahoula because it it wouldn't have you know flown in my house so yeah um well behavior yeah behavior is like so dynamic that's kind of the entire nature of behavior too Mm mm-hmm and I also think, uh, you know, the self-fulfilling prophecy, if I get X dog and I know stereotypically is supposed to be like X, Y, and Z, then that's what we're going to look for. We're going to overlook other sorts of behaviors too. So, okay. I'm done, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting also because sometimes you see these, um, what could be owner raider playing into what we genetically find too. So when we try to associate genes with behavior, um, we sometimes find things that are surprising. So one of the behaviors that we looked at was howling. And uh, of course, we found two super significant um, associations to the genome for uh, how frequently a dog howls. But we found one sub-significant one that fell within a gene that's been um, described previously as affecting whether or not someone is a morning person, Um, (laughs) which is weird in, in dogs, but it makes you think, well, maybe the owners of dogs who howl more often, especially more often in the morning are maybe morning people and that the owners would then rate their dog as howling more often because they're being woken up by the Mm -hmm. howling or something to that Mm -hmm. kind of circular end where what we're finding, the trait in question is howling, but what we're finding is maybe a gene associated with whether a dog is an early bird or not. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take more questioning and more (laughs) um, phenotyping to figure out if that's actually the case. Yeah. Oh God, I just had one more question. I, I totally lost it. I uh, never mind. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I know if I'm not up on time, the dogs are my alarm clock. That's for sure. Uh, over to Blue. There we go. Uh, good evening, and I am enjoying your conversation uh, immensely, especially since while I'm listening to you. I'm watching the Westminster Kennel Show. <laughs> it's a little on the nose, isn't it, today? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they're all having fun telling the wonderful traits of their breeds. <laughs> and of, of the dogs that I have owned over the years, most of them have been mixed breeds. Most of them have been abused. I take them on purpose. Um, But the only breed that I have actually had that seemed to have distinct characteristics, and everyone I see seems to be the same, is the dachshund. (laughs) And I'm wondering if your survey uh, showed anything in particular (laughs) about them, because... (laughs) Uh, of the those that I've had, of those I've cared for, and of those I've just watched, like Caruso in your uh, in Canada, uh, they all seem to play alike, run alike, bark alike, <laughs> do everything alike. And I'll let you answer my question. And I'm really appreciating this talk because it's very interesting. Of course. Yeah. I've heard a lot of that about dachshunds too, but strangely enough, there wasn't anything significantly um, distinct on the personality traits that we saw. It almost 
trended towards dachshunds being more independent, much like beagles, and a little less sociable with other dogs. But we didn't find any significant differences in the dachshunds that were enrolled in the study from when we compare them with random dogs. If I looked at um, dachshund ancestry, I don't know if there was any extreme distinctions for the dachshund. I think that just means we need more dachshunds because I've heard <laughs> this from people anecdotally about dachshunds and I still haven't seen it statistically come out in our We need more dogs. Study. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it almost looked like they were trending towards being more independent, um, less fitable, slash also a little less sociable with other dogs. But I, it's not enough to say that that is significant. Interesting. Well, if someone chooses to, perhaps on your staff, go back through documentation. Some time ago, there was, and I mean, this was like in the 50s, maybe early 60s. There was a study came out about dogs that were smarter than their owners. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sorry, you know what? Neither, neither one. I of do yours see what people tweet on a daily basis, so you know. So to, well, to out outsmart their owners, <laughs> smarter than their owners, and they're the herding breeds generally because they are left to do tasks independently, um, such as the Pyrenees, and uh, there's another one from Turkey that is raised. Is the Marama? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. And uh, it was it was very interesting, uh, needless to say, but uh, <laughs> it might add a slant to what you're working on. <laughs> yeah, and we also we saw that a lot of those livestock guarding breeds are the more independent ones. Um so the Great Pyrenees was one that came out as significantly more independent than other other dogs <laughs> and other breeds. There's a there's a guy we follow named John Rush. He's got two of them. They're they're adorable. Those Great Pyrenees dogs. Thanks, Blue. Okay. Um. Okay. On to on to Amanda and then Peaceful Warrior, and uh, and then we have a couple more people waiting in the wings. We'll see what the time's at. And we'll we'll talk to Kathleen if she's still good after that. So Amanda, yeah, Amanda, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Hello. I would like to introduce myself. I'm from California. I do dog training. I'm a business owner. Um, Kathleen, I would love to take a survey based on a few different breeds of just what I know by dog training, let alone dogs that I've owned. I've owned dachshunds. Um, I, I would have to say the most stubborn breed out there is huskies. <laughs> Um, the most hyper breed would be a Labrador. So um, I want to just touch on a couple topics that people have mentioned. Some lady was talking about dogs following them to the bathroom. Um, someone that works with dogs and understands the dog's brains and works with their behavior. The reason why dogs follow you to the bathroom <laughs> is you are letting your guard down. And this is for every breed. This does not matter which. It's not a certain breed that does it. Every dog breed will do it as long as they are loyal to you. If we were to go to the bathroom, they're going to follow us and they're going to sit out the door because in their pack, that's what they do when their leader is resting, sleeping, using the bathroom, whatever. Um, dachshunds are... I want to touch on the lady that had dachshunds. Um... Uh, my parents raised them AKC showmanship. They are loud. And I will never own one after my parents showed them. Like, I just, they're rats and they just bark and bark and bark and do not be quiet. So, um, but I would love to take a survey so that I can touch base and see just for my own knowledge with dog training and to help out my end, if that would be okay, Kathleen. Yeah, that sounds great. I have the link up in the nest, Amanda, uh, to Darwin's dogs. Um, and, and like Kathleen, anybody can enter it, right? You just have to register your dog. You have to, I'm trying to think what's the process. There's a link. Become a citizen scientist. Is that what people would click on? Yeah. yeah. You can make a profile, but also um, others in your household can join the profile too and take the survey for yeah. the same dog if they would like to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a uh, 
up in the nest there. I want to touch on one more subject someone said earlier. I think it was someone I've been talking to for a minute. Her name's Sarah. She, we were talking about aggressiveness, and I don't think any dog is ever born to be aggressive. It is taught and learned to them. Um, and someone was talking about dogs being like humans, and I mentioned to a lot of my dog training classes that dogs are like humans and you have to think about in training aspect like I train dogs every day all day 9 to five thirty. if we potty train our kids we're potty training our dogs if we're teaching our kids and how to act in society we're teaching our dogs how to act in society it all falls in line they think the same way we do when we're hurt they come and coddle us just like when they're hurt we coddle them their brains, honestly, I work with dogs and I do not work in the customer service industry no longer because dogs are smarter than humans. <laughs> I do have yeah. to make that point. So I love animals. I love dogs. And this is my probably my favorite chat. Oh, thanks, Amanda. Yeah, I mean, dogs live such richly emotional lives. They're very like, you know, you can't underestimate the fact that they have a lived experience too. And I'd say that definitely our survey support the idea that aggression is more of a response to the world or an experience-based thing than anything else. Um, at least the factor that we study um, agonistic threshold um, from our surveys seemed more to be a contextual type of thing. Hmm. Um, it was always aggression displayed in response to un discomfort at the veter veterinarian, um, in response to scenarios where you're being grabbed at. Um, it was always, almost always a contextual thing and without that context um aggression doesn't mean very much as a term or um really it's not a unitary thing can i ask you one question kathleen what is the most stubborn breed that you have come across in your study the most stubborn does it's, not listen does not care will not look at you nothing <laughs> it's the beagles and the basset hounds i'm sorry to say <laughs> Oh, See, the Basset I Hounds. Think, I love those guys. Don't tell Sarah that, but um, I've literally trained beagles, and I've had a few stubborn beagles, but I can get them to do more than the husky. The huskies look at me, and they're like, yeah, no, and they go and lay down. They do not care. Yeah, the huskies are on that end of the spectrum as well. Um, it, it could be that the beagles respond well to food, which I don't, we didn't address many of the food related questions in the study, but I, if I were to reanalyze the data today, I bet the food would have a big role. All right. Thank you for everyone's time. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen, do you have another 20 minutes? If I bring up a couple yeah. more, are you sure? That's okay. Yeah, I do. Thank you. For, well, thank you so much for being so gracious with your time. Oh, no problem. Okay. Um, Peaceful Warrior and then Kim, and then I'll bring up the two people requesting Donna and uh, Zochiti. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to say that. Okay. Peaceful Warrior, go ahead. Yes. Thank you for having me. Um, this this is a fascinating uh, chat you're having. Um, I, I came a little bit late to the dance, as is my custom, but here I am. Um, a couple of questions. Um, well, first of all, uh, let me preface this by saying I'm um, I'm dogless at at, at this point. Uh, I lost my uh, my wonderful dog almost two years ago. I, there's something in me that's uh, I'm still mourning, and I know that might sound ridiculous. No, it but, doesn't. Uh, no, not at no, all. I'm so sorry. Not at yeah. all. Yeah, uh, I mean, we had lost the previous one before him. To, you know, road accident. He ran up the street, and boom. You know, and then he we lost him to cancer. He was a um, he was a uh, Chihuahua and Pomeranian mix. I think the, the most wonderful uh -huh. dog in the world to me <laughs> uh -huh. is my dog. So, but anyway, uh, I'll try to cut to the chase here. Um, I, so I I was going uh, I was looking for another dog at one point, and I, and I went in on AKC, and they had this thing you fill in the blanks of what you're looking for. Oh, fascinating. And, Yes, and, and so Still I put it in my yeah. criteria, and what comes up? The most expensive dog in the world. <laughs> what it was, was it? It's, it's it's called a barbet. Oh, a barbet. That's, not, that's also rare. It's not only. Oh my goodness! I mean, that's very rare. In, there, there, in all of the United States, any any uh, site that I went on, 
we don't have any. We're waiting. You're going to have to wait another six months. You're going to have to wait another <laughs> six months. It's it's called a barbet. And the, the the thing of it is that intrigued me is that it's a French water dog. Oh, a lot they're of curly cute. Hair. Yeah, it's it's it, it, but the barbet means beard in France in French. And I think the algorithm was sensing that I have a beard. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was. But I says, oh my goodness, they're they're like five thousand dollars. It's I mean. To me, that's expensive on, on my for my taste. Yeah. But anyway, and and so my uh, my so uh, no more. I'm not even thinking about a barbet at this point. Although they're a lovely dog, and I would wouldn't mind having one. But my question is, um, I was reading about the Japanese Akita, and it it was basically saying you don't want a Japanese Akita if there's anything on your yard that runs because <laughs> it will go after it. And it will go after it aggressively, um, and and then I and and I don't know how true that is. I mean, on your studies, you may see that that be, I, and I believe there's somewhat of a herding, not a herding dog, but maybe like in the terrier or something. I'm not sure yeah. what type. But, yeah. So with with chasing, and, that's that's considered part of what is kind of the predatory sequence. Um, Got it. So and, in our study, we talk a lot about those behaviors as well, but uh, go on. And, and, and so, and uh, so I, I got to thinking even further. Um, I spent, uh, I was, uh, I was in the service and I spent time in Korea and um, there's a dog that's indigenous to an island there called Jindo and they call it a Jindo gay. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah. I've heard of the Jindo. Yeah. The Jindo. So I was thinking, are they similar to the Akita? Because I, it, they seem to have that curled tail, the you know the the kind of pointy ears that are you know like that stand up and a long longer snout and stuff. And and I'm thinking because Japan and Korea are so close. Uh, I mean, do, do you have like timelines as to how many thousands of years dogs go back? I mean, like any particular breed. Yeah, there were actually a few studies, I think, that um, tried to date the kind of like basal dogs and how um, how they spread through the globe and what the exact timing is on representation from those lineages. Yeah. Um, it kind of pre it predates this idea of the show dog breeds where they're breeding, um, you know, based Gosh. on pedigree, but more so, based on, you know, region and that sort so, of thing. So the fact that the, the Jindo gay in Korea and the the Akita in Japan, just the geographical location would might give you a hint that, yeah, they're going to look similar. They're going to, they're going to, at the very least, they're going to genetically cluster together. Um, what we call basically there's a lot of genetic similarity because they probably share a lot of the same ancestry um, to each other. So I think there was actually a recent study looking at a lot of the Japanese breeds uh, versus other breeds of dogs and, kind of their relationship towards, uh, I think, what's called like an eye gaze test, like whether they'll look at people when they're solving a difficult task. Mm. Um, wow. And I think they came out as pretty distinct. In our study, we only had enough dogs from, I think, the Shiba Inu breed to mm -hmm. say much about um, the, that Japanese breed in particular. The Doge. Which, yeah, the Doge. The Doge <laughs> was, you know, significantly more likely to be aloof and I don't know if I could extend that out and say that the Jindo or the Akita would also be aloof. I don't think we had enough data from each of those, but they are um, from the same region. Well, not the same region, but it's probably from the same ancestors um, that generated those populations of dogs. Got it. Okay. Thank but you. I'm not sure the exact timing on when they separated or when they became breeds. Yeah. Got it. Thank you very much. Of course. I'm always amazed because uh, on, on my podcast, I do a, a pet science little thing and like i swear every year there's some new evidence that dogs just keep dating further and further back in human history um, yeah we don't have a precise precise no, date yet it's no. still it's still being worked out especially as they find um like new archaeological digs mm -hmm. and lining that up with the genetic data it's hard because the breeds have very strange genetics <laughs> based on how they've been bred too so piecing apart the puzzle of okay how does this line up with the archaeological timeline of dogs is really difficult. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Peaceful Warrior. Thanks for coming to the space. Uh, Kim, 
Go ahead. Thanks for waiting patiently. And then we've got no, no. then we've got Donna and uh, I, I hope I say it. Uh, vaxxed. Okay. Uh, but go ahead, um, Kim. Uh, Kathleen, congratulations on the study. It sounds like it was super, super interesting. I, I love dogs more than I like most people. Um, I am Jason. I am a former chow chow owner. Oh, okay. Uh, Chow Chow is, I think, Japanese for don't get one. <laughs> um, they're extremely hard-headed, extremely independent. Uh, it was the first dog I'd ever had. I learned the lesson of spay and neutering a male, well, neutering a dog, a male, because <laughs> when adulthood comes, they decide they're going to rule the roost. And under all that floof is solid muscle and a bit of an attitude uh currently did, they, did you probably, have to worry about them getting jiggy with other animals uh, no people um <laughs> he bit Sorry. my brother he bit my brother through steel-toed work boots and 20, 25 years after we finally had to get rid of him, there was still blood stains on the bathroom door from where he tried to take my brother's nose off. Oh, my goodness. Totally unprovoked. Most dogs have a, I'm getting annoyed, I'm getting annoyed, growl, I'm really getting annoyed, bite. With our cow, it was bite. There was no warning, and my brother was feeding him, playing, and all of a sudden the dog turned. It was an unneutered male, and bit him right on the face and almost took his nose off. Wow. So he was, he was a bit of a challenge. Um, the c- question I have currently for Kathleen, I have a pug bulldog mix. He's a rescue. We have no background on him. Any insight? He's cute, but good Lord, dumb as a stump. <laughs> Any insight into the pug bulldog Brain, pug, bulldog, personality. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's see. It's interesting when you cross the two, too. Did you do a genetic test? No, but when we when we uh, when we adopted him, the the Humane Society said pug Boston, and he looks very puggy. He's he's he, he's nerves, got the pug he look, there, like tail. Something. Bulldog, yeah, he's got the curled over tail, the shorter muzzle, not super, super short, but he's broad across the chest like a bulldog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's characteristic of the English bulldogs for sure. Yeah. I think they, we, I don't think we had enough of them, of pugs at least enrolled to get much of a read on whether they were distinct. Okay. Yeah, surprising. Actually, they're they're so popular that I'm actually surprised. Yeah, yeah that yeah. is surprising. Like, mm-hmm. pugs are... Yeah. Hmm. Okay, don't okay. just wondering. Uh, what oh, about yeah, the... No what, did you get enough chow chows in your study? I, I'm curious, Kathleen. Not purebred. Uh, the chow chow was best represented mostly among mixed breed Oh, dogs. right, the mixed so breed you mentioned. Answer, yeah, yeah, it's strange. They weren't very um, popular enrolled as purebred dogs, okay. but in the mixed breed dogs that we sequenced, we found a lot of chow ancestry. Okay. So we were able to at least get some read on how chow ancestry might affect personality. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't see anything distinct with um, agonistic threshold, which was kind of the contextual aggression. But we did see that um, more chow ancestry dogs were less likely to retrieve objects. Um, other than that, it wasn't, wasn't an incredible effect of chow. More likely to have the pointy ears for sure mm. if they had chow ancestry. So fascinating. Okay, thanks, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Donna, and then over to Shotali. We'll have to get you to Sochi. Okay, okay, so Donna first, and then Sochi. Well, hello, everyone. I've missed being on the chat, and uh, I just got to say what a good time to come back because Kathleen, a super impressive study, and congrats. I know that's such um, a hard labor of love and work, so great job. Um, so I have a Husky, uh, her name is Sasha and she's broken. And the reason why I say she's broken, she doesn't howl. She doesn't bark. She doesn't talk. She's the sweetest dog ever. She does have that high 
spray drive. Uh, but yeah. I, I, I just want to throw out there that it, like she'll kill rabbits, whatever comes running in the yard. Uh, <laughs> kind of like uh, when they were talking about the Akita um uh, but the one thing I will say is when you're ready to do a cat study, my cat volunteers as tribute because she's more dog oh, yeah, than the dog. She brings, she fetches. Sasha will not fetch. You can throw a ball, a stick, anything, water, anywhere. She's like, nope. And Callie, I can throw whatever and she'll go get it and bring it to me. And in fact, uh, I've been out of town and as I'm sitting here, she's brought me a carrot, a taco, a fake mouse and a fake bird so she if when you're ready to do the cat study i'm just saying right now i volunteer as tribute that basically describes my my cat um uh, well all my animals have passed away since um mm. actually since november oh, i'm um, so sorry my, to hear that Kathleen. my first dog actually todd he he passed away um and but we had the cats before we brought the dogs into our house so we had two farm cats that were brothers they were very much you know kind of dog like uh would would definitely bring me the prey and that sort of thing except bringing the dogs into the house um with the cats kind of as established and my dog as a puppy I feel like he learned a lot of cat-like behaviors such as like licking his paw and then using it to clean his face or jumping oh. up on high objects so it's kind of so funny cool. yeah, they, they seem to have rubbed off in each other I can't know if that's a real thing or not but I, I would say that the cats taught him to be more cat-like that's awesome. Like the one thing I will say about having Huskies, because um, I've had all kinds of dogs growing up, but the past two have been Huskies and we lost um, Moki last year. But the one thing about training them is you have to make yourself the dominant person and you're the alpha. And if you're the alpha, they're in line. That dog does not get out of line. You look at her like you're messing up and she's perfect. Uh, so that's the one thing I know about establishing Huskies. I know they can be really hard headed, but once you establish that you're the alpha, they'll do anything for you. They are the sweetest dog. I love and it. But thank love you for huskies. your time. Yeah. Thank you. I love Huskies. They're so cute. <laughs> See, oh. yes. Okay. Over to Sochi. <laughs> Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, Kathleen, I am very interested in your study because uh, I am a first time dog owner and I locked out with my Frodo. He's the one in the picture, in my profile picture. Thank you. He is a Shih Tzu. And uh, he is the sweetest. He doesn't bark. He is so zen. So... I don't know. It's 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 hard to put into words how 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 passive he is. Aww. And and uh, and and I, I I say I locked out because um, when I was looking for a dog, uh, I needed a small dog, and I was told several times that toy breeds are jappy dogs that. Don't get a small dog. And I'm like, I live in an apartment building. I cannot have a big yeah, dog. Yeah, nothing else but small dogs. Yeah. And and uh and 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 I was as and I was wondering how much of that is true. I mean, he, he's a cheat too, and I, did I lock out? Uh, I mean, it's it's very rare for a dog not not to bark at all. I mean, he does, but he chooses not to. <laughs> And we were actually, yeah, we were pretty surprised. We expected size to play a much, you know, bigger role in a dog's uh, behavior. Um, it didn't seem once you accounted for breed, we didn't see as much of an effect of size on a dog's behavior, except for things like whether or not they'd shiver or whether they'd avoid water, which I think is more of a thermoregulation thing. Like a smaller dog would shiver more often because they're a little colder yeah. than because they oh. have anxiety or something like that. Shih Tzus were kind of interesting. Initially, we were seeing that they actually tended to retrieve balls, which was super weird, but that didn't actually end up holding out statistically. No. But, yeah. He, he plays fetch very well. Yes, that's what I kept hearing from Shih Tzu owners because we were trying to find out, like, was that a real thing? Why are the mm -hmm. why are the Shih Tzus retrieving so much more often than we would have expected? He because is, a lot of the he boy is very obedient also. I I mean I went through I went through a to a training class but but he is very obedient he he 
you know, I told him where to go to the bathroom. I told him how to fetch. I told him, uh, you know, don't, don't beg for food and all that stuff. And, and he, and he, he follows. Oh, so sweet. That's great. Yeah. He's very, very good. And, and I had, I had another question about your study. How yes. much of it, how much of it did you consider uh, nurture versus nature? Because um, for humans, for example, uh, we we have such a long childhood period. We are so dependent on our parents for such a long time, and and of course that affects our behavior. But in 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 dogs that they they are winged out within months. Um, I mean, how much of it, uh, how much of their behavior could be pack related from when they were living with their mother? Uh, I I remember at the beginning of this uh, chat that uh, Jason was telling us about Beaker being the daughter of hunting dogs. Yes, yeah, both and, of her parents are hunting dogs, and, and they come from parent like they're all all how, of the parents. Are, how much are hunting did dogs. the study consider that maybe Beaker had behavior from her pack behavior from 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 when when she was being uh, brought up before being weaned out. Yeah, we. I mean, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, what this means maybe for dog breeders too, but I, I think the other aspect is that part of the reason people go to dog breeders is because they have access to the dogs early in life and they can kind of uh, guide that early life experience to be positive and uh, that sort of thing as well. We saw that... Uh, kind of discrete behaviors like retrieving. Retrieving was our most heritable behavioral trait and it was still only around 50 to 60% genetic, 50 to 60% nur nature rather than around 40% nurture, which still says to us that even though retrieving is something that can be very genetic, can be very ingrained, it's still something that's influenced by other forces like say training you can still train a dog to retrieve balls even if it's not a retriever who's going to naturally do it anyway so like frodo like yeah uh, yeah like what what is expected from a chi tzu right mm. exactly and then i'd say that most behavior was at least a quarter heritable um a lot of behaviors were at least a quarter heritable but that still leaves a lot of room for experience environment and training to play a major role so it's, it's always been, it's always a complex interaction between genetics environment nature and nurture that kind of synthesizes the dog's personality into one big package that is amazing work thank you caitlin of course thank you All right. Thank you so much for our speakers. I think we'll uh, we'll wrap up the room. Kathleen, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. No, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and for talking about your study. Um, and remember, everybody, the link is up in the nest to Darwin's Dogs. If you want to register and take that survey, Bunsen and Beaker took it. Um, and it was fun. I really enjoyed doing the survey. And to be honest with you, I answered it as... I answered it as honestly as I could. So, oh, thank you. Yeah, I tried my best not to be biased. Um, because... Oh, it, it, it's hard. It's hard not to be with dogs. <laughs> I feel like, but if we get more and more dogs, then we'll discover more and more things. And we're already finding some really interesting genes related to behavior. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we found a howling gene that in people it affects you know speech development in the brain so we're thinking well that's a really interesting candidate for why some dogs howl more often than others wow that's so cool i love i love that every time we we get large bits of data and we sort it out there's like these little nuggets in it that's just fascinating yeah i love i love digging into kind of um what's going on here which is why the howling one is super interesting especially the one that was like a morning person gene. It's kind of like not what you would expect, but also makes sense. And that's why it definitely warrants further investigation. It's like those kind of leads that really drive me to do this kind of research. Yeah. Um, what's next for you, Kathleen, finishing up your PhD? 
Yeah. So the last thing I'm doing for my dissertation is digging more into the compulsive behavior, um, compulsive behavioral disorders that happen in dogs. So um, certain dogs develop disorders where they will perform a task repetitively. Um, we call these compulsions or repetitive behavior. So tail chasing, uh, snapping at invisible flies, um, staring at walls, kind of um, these might be similar to human obsessive compulsive disorder, and we're not entirely sure yet. So we're going and trying to compare what genes are involved in, in both human OCD and canine compulsive disorder. Right. And that's going to kind of be the last bit of my thesis um, before I wrap up next spring. That's fascinating. I did a, I did something on my podcast uh, a couple weeks ago about dog ADHD and how closely it resembles human ADHD. Yeah, that's kind of where we started with the study too, is um, it wasn't just that we wanted to study the differences between breeds, but we wanted to find if there are any genes involved in disorders that dogs experience, whether it be, you know, their physical health or their behavioral health. Awesome. Well, we're excited for whatever you, what comes out from that. So, thank you guys so much. As we wrap up the space one more time, thank you so much to have uh, having Kathleen Morrill here. Give her a clap. Give a, give some emojis out there. I'm going to do the same thing. This was such a great discussion. Also, thank you to our speakers who came up to ask such great questions. And all of the audience, you could be anywhere on a Tuesday, but you're here in our space. And that means a lot to us. Thank you so much. Remember, on Saturday, we have Pet Chat. We play games, there's prizes, and you can talk about what's going on with your pet that week. Dogs, cats, frogs, birds. I don't think anybody's talked about frogs, actually. Um, but that's Pet Chat on Saturday. Now, Chris and I are going into the summer, and that means we have a little bit more time. So there will be the odd special space running in July. Um, we've been working behind the scenes, and we're having some really respected dog trainers come on um, which we'll advertise and you can come and ask questions about what's going on with your dog and maybe get some answers uh, our first dog training space is actually next Tuesday um, when, when science chat normally is okay that's about it um, I see Chris is having trouble with her audio <laughs> so normally I throw to her and she says something but she's gone uh, take care, everybody. And one more time, Kathleen, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Such a great talk. All right. We'll hopefully see everybody on Saturday for Pet Chat. More science, empathy, and cuteness. Take care, everybody. Space ending in three, two.